right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our first session of a series uh, that will play out in 2021, known as A Deeper Inquiry. Uh, we're bringing you the series of virtual activist meetups that are going to dig deeper into pressing political and human issues. Hopefully we spark some honest conversation and experience sharing around ideally difficult and challenging subject matter. And this is all for the intention to build a wider community of close ties in the European grassroots activist scene, with obviously also some inputs from our friends and allies around the world. Session number one, the dark side of environmentalism. I'm going to give you a quick rundown of our agenda. So we'll have a quick intro that we'll soon wrap up. Then we go to a framing of the session with Hilary Moore and experiences from the fr front lines in Poland uh, from Kuba Kogolewski. Then we'll go to the breakout. Mic muting everybody, please. This is why we need to mute the mics. And uh, then we go into breakouts for a little bit of more intimate, quiet chatter. And then we come back for an open discussion with everybody in. We're also gonna give you a couple of guiding questions for the breakouts that we'll share in the chat. So without further ado, I will start with introducing Hilary Moore, uh, the author of a kick-ass publication uh, shared with me a few weeks ago by our director, Romy Kramer, and I sat down and read it um, that one evening, and uh, Burning Earth, Changing Europe. And it explores eco-fascism and a lot of insanely cool stuff on how movements get co-opted, um, how movements are more confusing and perplexing and lines are blurring on which side of the political spectrum you are than ever before. Uh, Hilary Moore is an author and academic and social justice activist. And I will pass the baton over to Hilary right now. Cool, thank you. I will clarify, I'm not an academic, but I do like to write. Those are things that exist simultaneously. Um, cool, thank you. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here with you all. And thank you, Ivan and Guerrilla Foundation for the invitation to be here. And Julia and Marlena are running tech for the evening, which I've already said is magic to me. So thank you for that. And Kuba, thank you, my co-presenter, but mostly just thanks to you all who are here tonight. Um, and especially thanks to anybody in your life right, who makes it possible for you to be here. So maybe a childcare provider, someone's cooking for you, or maybe just shared interests and shared the link with you. Um, there are many relationships and labor that make this event possible. So just saying thank you. So by the way of introducing myself, Hillary, she and her pronouns. I was born and raised on unceded indigenous Miwok territory in the state of California in the US. And that feels important to honor the land that we come from, but also stay on um, when we begin events as a way of acknowledging just the histories that still shape the world today. And so in my case, settler, settler colonial legacies, legacies of occupation and domination. So for me, it's important because there's also big legacies of resistance and knowing that whatever country we're in, our relationship to that history helps us shape where we're going. So I'm a person who has spent the last 15 years working on issues of climate change and racism and the far right and resistance. And first in the States and now in Germany, but I've done a lot of that work as a political educator and a facilitator in community organizing projects. So I'm someone who works with groups in communities to make certain kinds of changes and shift power. And I've done some of that work as an educator and some as a writer, but that's how I'm coming to you all tonight, right? Like with those kinds of questions, because what I care most about is how do our movements of resistance and fighting for justice, however you wanted to find that, we can talk about that, um, become more effective and how can we bring more people into this work? So that's how I come to this work. I think that that's important distinction. Um, tonight, I'll talk about eco-fascism in detail and also talk about how certain concepts around climate or nature become very slippery. 
and the potential risks that that slipperiness has for progressive or left groups doing environmental or climate work and in climate struggles. So yeah, again, I just want to say thank you for the Gorilla Foundation. I think that these conversations are really important. Grassroots radical work, connecting across different contexts, and just glad to be part of bringing people together. Okay, so let's dig in. Um, I think it's useful to begin with some shared ideas, keywords, definitions. The first one we can explore is ecofascism. Ivan already kind of brought it up. And there are a few different ways to understand ecofascism. There's massive big texts and articles and all, everything in between you can nerd out on. But for the purposes of tonight, I'll say a few simple pieces that we can work with all together. So when I say ecofascism, I mean a fascist movement or a group that uses racist or xenophobic interpretations of the environment or climate or ecology or nature, like those are all different but similar concepts, to popularize calls for reorganizing society. So that means it's revolutionary, right? It's not loyal to the current system wherever it is. And it's usually around values that are authoritarian, that are nationalistic, often white nationalistic, and masculinist values. So I will say that ecofascism is not new, despite recent articles and so many people getting very excited about it around COVID-19, it had different reoccurrences then, but it's a historical phenomenon. So that's important for us because that means that progressive and left movements have the opportunity to learn from the past and we don't have to start from scratch. So that's an advantage, right? Um, the most well-known historical moment for ecofascism, as I'm sure many of you know, was in Nazi Germany. There is a whole green wing that was very important in creating the ideology that kept the regime going. Um, so it was a fascist regime, like these are the core points. It reorganized society. And the concepts used were Heimat and Heimatschutz in Lebensraum to link German people and culture or a certain version of German culture to nature, soil, and blood. And in other words, the concept used to, of nature reinforced the ideas of racial superiority. And we all know that mobilized people, it changed methods of governance, and it justified the practice of genocide in the Holocaust. Okay, so ecofascism doesn't exist in the past only. Rather, it remakes itself it reoccurs in different moments, and this is where we can get more skillful together. Um, more recent examples of direct ecofascism are seen in mass shootings. I'm sure you all are familiar. In March, in March of 2019, in Christchurch, New Zealand, a man killed 51 people, injured 49 more, referencing ecofascism in the Great Replacement, right, which is the supposed extinction of the white race. Another horrific event was August 2019 in El Paso, Texas, where the shooter talked about ecofascism as it related to environmental protection and the threat of overpopulation. So these are just two events. But it's not just historical and it's not just um, first person shooter mass shootings, right? There's something else also that we need to get very skillful about. And these events are devastating and they should be known and addressed. And I think we have the opportunity here to dig a bit deeper and focus shouldn't just be how many times an event like this happens, but rather what is taking place that allows ideas like these to spread? What are the many ways that these ideas can show up even in our movements? And even more importantly, how can we take actions that challenge that spread? That's what I care about. I hope that we can do that together. So, in the publication, Burning Earth, Changing Europe, I propose that one way this deadly version of ecology can spread is when core concepts about nature are used but not interrogated. So not investigated, not looked under and examined. And for example, let's take the idea of protecting the environment. It's a very reasonable demand. All kinds of groups take up this demand and yet what is the difference between the El Paso, El Paso shooters understanding of environmental protection and what we mean or left and progressive groups in our demand for climate protection. Not only should we know what the difference is, but also how to organize with those differences. So 
why does this matter? <laughs> why does this matter? Depending on how we talk about and use ideas of nature or climate, our activism could run the risk of first unknowingly propping up racist or right-wing or far-right interpretations of nature. We saw this, especially in the onset of COVID-19, there was numerous examples of climate activists as well as mainstream groups using slogans like humans are the virus, we are the virus, or even the more hippie version of like mother nature is healing. But the idea that humans are a parasite or a virus or somehow a negative contribution to a whole ecosystem, again, doesn't have to be inherently right wing or racist. But if you dig a little bit deeper, it's often anti humanist. And when you and when pushed often comes out a, a blame of people in the global south as an environmental factor of environmental destruction. So it can slip very easily if we aren't skillfully using it. Another risk that we run if we aren't so skillful is our messaging and stories being co-opted or taken from us and used and repurposed in ways that we did not anticipate. Um, the language of just transition is definitely one of these messages that gets used in a variety of ways towards different ends. A couple of years ago, I was working with an environmental organization trying to stop mountaintop removal in Appalachia. And they had campaigns around just transition, around local economies, around clean water. And they didn't expect that organized white supremacists would actually use that same messaging, the same image from those posters, and have their own events, but with the stipulation that local economies, clean water, um, ending a mountaintop removal to protect white people. So that distinction caught them off guard and maybe Kuba might talk later about different ways that just transition framing gets used by industry and governments to halt and stop, you know, meaningful transitions. Um, another risk that we all run if we aren't very clear and skillful um, together with how we use ideas of nature is that we might attract right wing or far right groups people into our groups. And I think this is an important political question, right? We, I want to emphasize choice here. It's a legitimate question if your group is willing or not willing to work with people or other groups who hold a very different vision of society, right? So in the summer of 2020, environmental students at Germany's uh, Halle University were first confused and then quite alarmed by far-right ecology groups um, flyering in their area with flyers that said farms instead of agriculture factories. And the subtext was, let's chase the globalists off our acres. So clearly an anti-Semitic trope. And um, here's, here's where the risk comes in, right? Like, how do we know what our distinctions are and those boundaries are? So environmental and climate work in particular runs these risks. There's a whole bunch of reasons why the book talks about that in greater detail, but the whole point is to help us deepen the conversation about these risks before they become unexpected situations forced upon us. I think that's the key point here. Like, can we discuss this together before that and make choices before that? So that main question that always comes up for me is what do we need to know? And so that we have more choice and more skill in navigating these risks. And there's three things that at least I talk about that every climate activist needs to know. Of course, there's a ton more things that every climate activist needs to know, and I wanna hear what you all think those are. But the first three are um, climate change is not an inherently progressive issue. So how you, and then the second one is how you think and talk about climate may prop up racist right-wing positions. We talked about that. And the third one is the far right does not need to govern to influence. So for many of you, these may seem like common sense ideas, but why I think they're important to put out there um, very directly is that we all don't come from the same context. So what feels obvious in one region might not be so obvious in another. So let's go through these a little bit more and then I'll turn it over to Kuba to like dig deeper into the Polish context. Um, so climate change is not an inherently progressive issue. 
I think for anybody who grew up in a Western country or anybody who's a bit on the younger side might need to spend more time with this point. For instance, in Germany, the left basically won over green and climate related issues in the 1970s. And now, right as publications, so publications, all kinds of right publications are talking about the need to take back the environment, reclaim it for a different set of politics. And at least in 2019, the Eurobarometer survey revealed that 93% of people who are willing to take the survey, of course, believe that climate change is a serious problem and that their government should do something about it. So we could assume the issue of climate will continue to have political weight. And this could also mean that anybody who's in the camp of climate skeptics or climate denialists might shift into a more active role. So I think an important question is that we should all be in and I want to hear what you all have to say is, is it worth keeping climate a progressive issue? Or is it neutral? Or does it not matter? And how do we do that? So just two more points here. We've already talked about this, but how you think and talk about climate may prop up racist right-wing positions. There's three main ways that I see those slips happening most often. Um, the first one is environmental protection when the cause or the alarm starts to blame marginalized groups. So for instance, Roma communities came under massive assault during COVID-19 policing. Another one is overpopulation, where the emphasis is on population size rather than corporate logic and practices of extraction. So digging deeper on overpopulation often exposes the idea that some people are disposable Right, so they could die, it's worth them dying while others are worth keeping alive. And how do you make those decisions that really resonates with Nazi Germany and life that is worth living? Uh, the last one is just that corporations uh, or elites are the bad guys, which is a reasonable line to toe in this kind of work. And yet if it's done unskillfully can very easily go into conspiratory conspiratorial and cabal narratives that most often again come from anti-Semitic propaganda. So, so last but not least, the far right does not need to govern to influence. There's a lot more to say here and I'll keep it short, but the point I'll end with is that fascistic tendencies often grow with the support of corporations or capitalist uh, entities when also moderate right-wing groups are attempting to accommodate that shifting sentiment. So in other words, one of the things that makes far right ideology dangerous is its ability to move across different um, sections of society. So it's not just on the fringe and this is how we can get more skillful. So the three things I want to hear and learn from you all is what is most relevant here in this, these framings about your context? Are these risks showing up in your work? And what does your group need to counteract that risk? And then I will pass it over either to Ivan or Kuba. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take over and give a quick intro. Thanks a lot, Hillary. And uh, we'll revert back once we get into the open, open uh, question part. So our next speaker is Kuba Gogolevsky, who I met by accident in Warsaw many years ago at the European Foundation Center conference. And we bonded because we were the two people, the only two people who really wore clothing that was colorful and were causing, like stirring shit up by asking really contentious questions. And so we were like, oh, okay, we're the outsiders, let's talk. And, uh, and then we ended up collaborating through the Guerrilla Foundation because Kuba is a senior finance campaigner and a board member of Development Yes, Open Pit Mines No, uh, Polish energy finance um, and a, a, po a Polish uh, activist group that focuses on preventing the building and construction of new lignite open pit mines. So thereby creating a constant communication between how is energy and finance and insurance sectors, how are they interlinked? Uh, because we need energy, but what kind of energy and at what cost? So he's gonna give us a little bit more about how movements and how these issues in movements are playing out across cities, villages, towns in Poland. Kuba, over to you. Um, thank you, Ivan. 
it was a really good conference and I really enjoy asking questions when people have the space. Why did he ask this? It's always fun. Um, talking about unceded territories, I know it's a, it's a fashion now in Australia, US. I come from unceded Kasheba territory. This land where I live by the Polish Sea has been passing ownership so much that it's even hard to think what nationality you hear. I'm currently Polish because I was born here as a Polish, but it could have been anything else. Um, um, I don't know if you can already see my screen. Uh, if yes, good. Um, my wife is German. Uh, my kids are bilingual. We are shifting countries regularly every three years in order to make those to come, come, uh, countries visible. So we, some of the bridges are able to be done. Um, um, before I go to the conversation, I'll share a few insights respecting, I mean, in regards to what Hillary said. Thank you, Hillary, for allowing me to read this publication. It's really deep thinking and thank you for bringing us together the Guerrilla Foundation. I, am, I come from the point that the only thing the opponents of social change need to do is do nothing. So actually the progressive change of redistribution is on the progressive movements to change the things as they are because maintaining the status quo does cause inequality, injustice, and all the things in the global south increasing and sucking up uh, uh, the worth. So this is one thing. So it's, we have to be much more active in order to change things. And it's, it's, it's true that the far right is a, is a very big thing, but also it's st the status quo as it is, is also a thing that, that needs to be, uh, be changed. And I think that, now I'll go more into, into Poland, but I think that also, um, I've been interesting later on, I don't have any questions, like just thinking about loud when you said about the, the murders is how would we call in political terms the slaughtering, for example, of nature protection rangers by poachers somewhere in the South or, you know, the nature defendants in the Amazon being constantly slaughtered by the corporation stuff. This stuff, the real fascist stuff, when there is no, you know, kind of question mark well, if the ideology is biased, is happening, unfortunately, Simon, we are a little lucky to be able to, to live in places when you don't get killed for displaying or defending what you are or some, in some places it's, it's, it's getting close to this. Okay, um, we are not, Poland is not one of them yet. I've, I've, I, as I said, I've been working with, with people in Tunisia, Egypt after the Arab Spring. It was a very, and Azerbaijan, it was a very humbling experience to know how fantastic a place you are is no matter what happens. Okay, getting back to the presentation, Currently, Poland is the third biggest greenhouse gas emitters. We are unfortunately swallowing countries as we go. After Germany, which has more than twice the double emissions uh, every year, and Italy. And uh, we have roughly, I mean, Poland has roughly 1% of global greenhouse gas emission compared to, for example, uh, Germany having 2%, and that's not historic emissions. These are just the current emissions. And the emissions were up 30%, it was mostly because of the uh, economy changing and the heavy industry collapsing, which people call hot air. But the problem is that it stayed relatively flat and even slightly increasing uh, uh, for the last 20 years. So as you see, the other countries who've been picking since then, relatively going down to the previous level, there was a dip and there is nothing and even, even progress. And of course, this is just the emissions as accounted by, by territory, which I think is a very biased and unfair way of treating it. It's not finance emissions, so it's not emissions of the financial sector from Germany, France, UK, etc., which are sometimes way bigger than the country. These are not uh, insured emissions, imported emissions, so all the other different ways of how you can count emissions. But that's the way INFC, uh, UNFC, UNFCCC sees it, and that's how we think about it, which is also when you're made to think in a certain way, you certainly don't even reflect how things would be different. Uh, the issue is that the consecutive Polish governments have opposed climate and energy policy of the EU. They've been generally climate denialist, going recently into climate septic more because it, it looks nicer, but still deeply inside climate septic. And they've been very much pro uh, protecting the coal, oil and gas interest very openly blocking EU climate policy, vetoing it, trying to be the tribal maker. So from this point of view, Polish energy policy and what happens down there is also important for the how progressive EU can get. Progressive only in climate policy terms to, to make this. That's one of the power plants we are currently trying to, uh, to prevent. It's on the Czech-German border and causing problems to Czech and Germans, which is uh, we are sort of in the face of going against the local community in Poland who really thinks that's the best thing can be because of other 
considerations. I think what in the context of, of the right and left, history matters a lot. In Poland, the, you know, since the 1990s, there were only two governments that you can consider from the left, and they were based on the post-communist and one president from, from the left. Left and right is also very, very biased. Trade unions, for example, are on the right in Poland because of considerations how they're related to post-communists. And ever since 2016, we had right, center-right shades of green and going way more into the right in the recent times. The leftists, for many, many times have been used as a dis discouraging uh, kind of a, a, um, an insult in, in public conversation. And so is environmentalists even today. When you see the media, when you see whoever using a frame ecologist, it's very different in the West. It's trying to put you down, take you the, you know, the, the expert level away from you and everybody can be an ecologist. Just, just to tell you when, when uh, Pope Francis published his uh, last encyclica, it was called in, Pol in Poland anti-Polish because it touched on environment and climate protection. So it goes to those extremes and those radical thinking with everything that has to do with coal and with its economies, whoever, it has to be ecologists, so it has to dis discredit it. Um, and um, senators and others in, in parliament are referring to eco-terrorism and all this stuff just to dislegitimize environmental organization. Climate justice narrative is largely inexistent in mainstream Poland politics discourse. There is very little real discussion about international climate solidarity with political debate being very inward looking and getting more and more uglier inward looking into what matters to us. Does air pollution in cities kill our citizen? How is our water protected? So it's not really as, um, as portrayed by, by, the, by the far right is generally the, the natural discourse is caused in our interest in climate. And very much, uh, there are of course grassroots, a lot of organizations working on, but in the mainstream, it's very inward looking. And since politics in 2015, you probably have seen it, have focused on division of society. So the main skill was pitting groups against each other, permanently dividing and creating conflict either with outside or inside. So judges portrayed as post-communist LGBT movement as endangering Polish tradition values and a very clamp down on LGBT community migration from Africa before, you know, before, um, before the election 2015 as bringing, uh, bringing parasite, whatever. So just trying one and one of despicable, despicable ways. And which is also interesting, but at the same time, Poland is one of the countries bring, it, taking in most refugees in, but there are refugees from Belarus and Ukraine. So there is this also this, there are good refugees and bad refugees, right? It's just the, the, the way that you filter and decide who you want to take in. Going back into, into uh, the work, uh, when, when we started, uh, when I started working for the foundation, um, I mean, maybe a brief, brief, um, brief history of what the experience is. I was working in Mexico and Greenpeace India before being expelled and not being able to come back for being too white for India, which was another, the reverse experience. Like the, the, in India, there was a sort of, at a certain point, nationalistic vision that Europeans shouldn't mess into internal politics. So they didn't really allow people to go back. Um, and I was fundraiser for Greenpeace. Then for 2011, 2013, anti-coal and public finance campaigner for C Bankwatch Network, which is a network of central and European organizations, coordinator for a project of monitoring EU international financial institutions in investment in the MENA region, very humbling experience in Brussels, and then into the, the, the role I'm currently in. And I joined because at this moment, the, the foundation and the movement was A, the only representative movement focused in the rural areas, and there is a very big tendency of most NGOs, environmental organizations to think and work with the um, um, bigger organizations, to think and work with the city communities and a lot of thinking and uh, visibility from the, let's say, city-based NGOs with different reflecting of the, of the uh, rural communities and there are different also concerns touching them. It was, um, I'll, I'll come back to it, um, so the, the coalition with the foundation is kind of a representation uh, was formed two years after the referenda from the local communities without any NGO, NGO involvement in eight different localities against open pit mines. There were there was the threat at the moment that you know simply people will be will be uh, resettled. There wasn't much of a climate consideration. It was 
it's our territory, they will, will our lives will eat our water, etc. So it may have much of a climate impact. Two years later, the NGOs and the experts actually realized that this is probably on top of the considerations of the of the uh, local communities and grassroots, the biggest climate challenge that's, that's facing uh, Poland. And so the coalition was formed of very different people with very different values of very different spread in terms of politics and all the other topics. And we learned to respect each other and work very specifically on this topic that united us. Because believe me, any other conversation sometimes was getting tough. And we actually educated each other in various, uh, various values, including climate and climate solidarity. It was a process of back and forth. And the, the beauty of it, but the, you could see actually that the people that were participating in protests that were joining are not city activists. I, I mean, you, you can talk about like, you know, but we, you don't judge people, but you can really see when people from outside the cities come to join protests and by, by the way they behave, they address in Poland versus the uh, demonstrations organized in cities by, by uh, whoever, progressive movements or others. So um, the fight was for 10 billion tons of lignite and it's mostly one, like we, there's one, one mine that we, we think it still will be canceled, but it's there. So it was a huge uh, 10 year effort of preventing this, this thing going forward. Um, the, and the local communities opposing, as I said, were not using uh, not using climate frames. The frames were against water protection, agriculture, resettlement, cultural, local values. So we, as a foundation, as a coalition, were keeping in mind that it's climate and from time to time referring to climate and doing a lot of alliances with climate movements, but also using a lot of other frames in order to get the things that we thought were important for, for, uh, for getting this victory done. And that brings us to the conversation what does it, what's the cost? Yeah, and uh, back in 2015, this coalition had the biggest mobilizing power on national scale, uh, which actually allowed us to also do the other thing that we managed to do, which is work on the finance system. Because when from taking it from the fight on particular pits and then to particular utilities, we're able to package both the utilities and these facts and Poland is a little bit of a toxic place when those calls are still developed, when climate politics are not expected in order to challenge wipe and one financial institutions, of course, in bigger coalitions, uh, working with people across the world of challenging the banks and the insurers that were providing insurance and finance to these, to these companies and those places. So it allowed to at the same time, keep the local content and have clarity and visibility about the legitimacy of the fight. And at the same time, be able to channel change that was going more than local. So you're trying to, to change too. And I actually think that we won't be able to win anything close to a, a 1.5 or two degrees or climate change if we don't tackle the financial, financial sector. And for the moment in the movement, there's way too little people focusing on finance rather than politics. There's this very wild belief that politics rules the finance and to a certain degree it can, but too little attention kept to this. And I think, um, I think that um, in 2017 we found, uh, we found the insurers, uh, we found who insures the police sector that allowed to, to, you know, to, to help really um, help the global campaign to also move the biggest biggest insurers and as I was saying by packing the, the Poland is a toxic product and with a clear social mandate we could contribute to both local fights and moving the European uh, insurance and in, uh, reinsurance industry away from uh, coal. Mm, and I think the last coming to this political part we have chosen to engage in those national politics with very specific asks and intervene on issues that we had a very clear social mandate on. So we consciously didn't like there are so many issues in Poland to tackle at the same time with all, all those fights, but we consciously decided that we didn't have the space and power to create more alliances and open more topics. That's a political choice and consideration. Uh, while working with climate justice in Perth, we have chosen times not to use climate arguments. And 
there's still lots of places and a lot of change for in, in Poland in the, in the finance uh, space, but of, of course, as I said, the social and political space is also closing. Now we are able to engage in struggles against uh, expansions of areas, even when there is no, you could say, local community consent. So with the legitimacy of the past, with the knowledge and with the kind of with the understanding of what, what it does. And as I said, we are currently creating a pretty big coalition, taking to different levels with Czech and NGO, local communities, uh, um, politicians, regional authorities, etc., which is considered a little bit against the local Polish interest in this very place because um, alternatives there are very few and there's a very big question what happens if actually this, uh, this goal is uh, maintained. Um, so what we have failed of, failed in, um, it's not very replicable. As I said, finance campaigning is very, very scarce and very geeky. So there is not really much replication of it and the climate movement with as much as it's embraced with the Fridays for Future equivalent, the, and the climate uh, justice and the, uh, um, thinking about political considerations, um, the repertoire, the tools of the movements are very much the usual. So protest reports, police advocacy, um, but not, uh, not going into spheres that are uh, more technical and climate mitigation Poland is driven by EU policy. So it did, it, we didn't get to a stage when, you know, if we, for whatever reason, stepped out like the UK, we'd actually still continue doing climate mitigation. Probably it would be all the reverse. So there is not this mass and not the social support for this kind of policy. It's still very, very much seen by a lot of parts of society as a, as a cost and by the industry and most it's only done because of the changing economics and finance, not because of the Deeper, a deeper consideration. Um, and as I said, the climate movement in Poland in general, the movement is focused on internal emissions. So what happens in Poland and not really that much thinking about what the Polish companies are doing outside. What, where, how much they're financing the coal mining in India, Kazakhstan, Serbia, other places, how much oil is mined in other places. So this social global south glo climate um, climate justice consideration is not that visible yet. And the far right is very strong and um, it's influencing politics more and more. And it has significant representation in parliament. And I think what's most scary is that actually having a very big appeal among young people. So this, this dream of the past, you know, that generations will just grow wiser. And at some point environment will be the number one issue. You can see it in the polls, you can see it in the election some part of this younger movement is growing very much um, in favor of climate and there is another one radicalizing to the right. And I think I'll stop here. All right. Thanks a lot, Kuba. I would now let everybody take a deep breath. <laughs> and um, we're gonna in order, we were thinking, I was thinking of, of uh, getting you all into question mode, uh, but instead what we're gonna do is make it easier for everybody to talk. And so we're gonna put you into smaller groups and we're gonna give you some questions. You can sit and talk about these questions and see what comes up, if it's interesting, if you like it, if you're moved to ask it, you'll ask us in the bigger uh, session where we all come back together. So we'll have about 15 minutes for the one and then another 15 minutes for the other. And I'm going to paste the questions in the chat so you will all have them there. And uh, I just need to find them. <laughs> all right, so here they are. I'm also going to read them out so that everybody has them and we're all aligned. <clears throat> Why am I missing the question? It's because I think it's here. All right, cool. So. Let's make sure I'm not messaging the questions sent to somebody privately because I've been using the private chat extensively. Well, <laughs> wouldn't you like to know what I've been saying? So um, here are the six questions. Um, in what way do you advocate for climate justice when discussing the just transition in fossil fuel dependent countries and communities in the global north? This is for the environmental activists. Um, some of you won't be an environmental activist. You'll have other questions that you can sit with. Um, would you consider equipment sabotage of fossil fuel infrastructure that would not put workers 
uh, that would not put workers at risk. Um, at ecofascism. So this is something that you can all discuss. You can all put yourselves in, in this position. Um, when is an alliance with the right and far right justified? Is there such an instance? Uh, what are the conditions or red lines that one needs to watch out for when negotiating or working with such an alliance? This is again, irrespective of the environmental context, it can apply to any context. What have you heard today that feels relevant for your work and your context? What do you take away from, from what you've heard so far? What are some similarities and differences between the narratives in your environmental or climate work and the narratives used by the right or far right groups? And what does your group need, your collective, your organization, in order to navigate um, some of these things well? And I would say aim to do two questions. So pick, uh, self-organize. So whoever seems to be the most vivacious person in your group, you can start talking, please do, to avoid the uh, awkward silences. Do a quick round of intros, um, introduce yourselves, um, and have, have a stab at at least a couple of those questions. Uh, if our questions are not good enough for you, you can come up with your own. Uh, this is also super welcome. And if anybody had some idea of something that they really wanted to discuss during the, during the speaker's time, uh, great, use that. This is a free space. We're gonna hopefully spread out uh, us who are keeping notes and minutes. And uh, so we'll be able to harvest something back uh, to the bigger group. Also, the more vivacious ones in the group, it would be cool if you were to ask some questions when we come back. Uh, so yeah, uh, Julia is gonna now whisk us off into breakouts. And uh, yeah, see you on the other side. We are back, everybody. We have lost a couple of people along the way. It's it happened. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I would encourage the vivacious ones once again to ask a question, make a statement, uh, come up with an idea. This isn't like a. It doesn't need. It's not. It doesn't need to be a schooling setting. We're going Ma'am, uh, you can you can expand on a topic. Um, you can introduce something new. Uh, what's coming up for you? And since I am in speaker view, I will. I don't see hands up. So the first person <laughs> starts speaking. Unmute yourself and take over. I'm not shy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll jump in. Uh, we were a small group, and uh, the int the topic in particular that interested me was the third question, which is when an alliance with the right and the far right is justified. Do you mind introducing yourself just real yes, quick? Yes, I, I was just going to. Uh, I'm Steve, and I'm from the Ambizadors, and we are a group that focuses on bees and pollinators and nature in general and trying to reconnect people or connect them deeper or reconnect them to nature. Uh, and what my experience has been is that bees are kind of this neutral bridge. And so I like the fact that we can build alliances with people of all different uh, political persuasions uh, and the diversity within our kind of coalition is really vast. Crossing socioeconomic uh, ranges and politics and nations and all the rest. So as long as politics are not specifically brought into the conversation, uh, I like that people from different groups can come in, participate, and uh, contribute. So I don't really have that issue. And I'm curious if other people use their causes as a unifier, as opposed to seeing it uh, bifurcate or kind of cause friction. Anybody want to take on a response? Sure, um, I can go. Um, yeah, I'm currently going by the name Sophie. I'm based in um, Germany and um, active in a campaign, uh, a collective that's called by 2020 Rise Up and um, like 
um, seeks to network different um, climate justice and social justice groups all over Europe. And um, we also like talked about the third question in our little group, um, but we had a slightly different point of view, um, mainly like when it comes to collaborating with like um, people who hold uh, right wing or far right wing views, um, we saw a problem um, arising when it comes to people from marginalized groups, like activists that stem from marginalized groups that would be discriminated against if like, like right wing um, people um, like are invited into the group. Um, and so what we sort of like developed as an idea was that it might be like, because sometimes like collaborating with um, other groups who hold also different views might be more like, um, might lead to more effective outcomes, maybe more like um, public uh, attention or whatever, more influence. Um, and then sometimes this might be just like, we like our core question was whether it might be justified to sort of like um, leave aside uh, our ideals and values as um, like intersectional and climate justice groups for in order to be like more effective and um, yeah we long story short <laughs> we sort of thought that it might be justified and like punctual like only um, like project-based call like corporations but not as a whole um, yeah but we weren't able to like think that through because of the like shortness of the time but I'm really interested in hearing your opinions also I guess it depends what you mean by left and right sorry if, are we allowed to jump in by ourselves we are yeah I guess what I mean, if you mean you know if right means backing the status quo that's destroying all of us or it means making the status quo even worse then I think you know collaborating with the right is not helpful if it means working with people of all beliefs to be able to really deepen where we are and understand our need to take care of each other then it's fine so it depends what you're meaning by right and left and what you're meaning by collaborate you know so I guess it, if I'm principle that I use is kind of like we need to value others and object to anybody not valuing others so there's a kind of like there's a there's a real moral thing in there that actually drives your politics then so it's like you're you're valuing other people everybody you're valuing everybody but you're objecting to anything in anybody including yourself that doesn't value others and i'm often not valuing others so i'm not putting myself in one camp rather than the other i like to be challenged when i'm not valuing other people i think that's really helpful and i don't value other people some of the time so there's something there for me that kind of works as a way of a principle i'm not sure if that's left and right but certainly it's about if left is being identified with the valuing of others, including the valuing of non-human beings, then okay, that's left. But if it's put as an ideology, it's not very, not very helpful. And if it's put as a way of othering, left can be a way of othering other people and saying, well, you're, you're on the right, so I don't accept you. So there's something for me about really putting the value of valuing other people and other beings at the heart. Once you've got that going, everything else flows. It's complex, it's an unbelievably complex world. And we can all be on the wrong side of the arguments. As long as we want to learn where we are, and know, know when we're on the wrong side, then it's a real deep way of reaching out. Yeah, no. I, could, I could just pick up where you left off there, Justin, and obviously we share the territory because we're both working in the UK, but I would say the UK is um, one to watch now um, because partly I don't recognize enough at the moment of the dangers of ecofascism in the UK on the other hand, even talking about it today makes me think it's coming in some way. And what I noticed last year was how um, Extinction Rebellion and the Brexiteers found a common alliance, right? So their alliance was, we can be independent, we don't need other people, we can grow our own food and we can produce our own energy. Right, so from the Brexiteers point of view, this was um, sort of anti-Europe. And from the Extinction Rebellion point of view, this was pro the planet, but they found an alliance there. And it was quite a friendly one. 
However, we may be moving into an era now over the next few years where this government starts to cut regulations around climate in the name of thriving as a British economy, right? If that happens, we will start getting the, it'll start looking and sounding more right wing than it does now. What happens to that rather fragile alliance, I think will be interesting. I'm not somebody who wants to buy into left right divides because I think they're belonging to an old system, but I can't also not deny them um, politically they exist and the narratives, especially around the media will start to align nationalism with cutting regulations. I think somewhere in there is what you've been talking about and it might start to come to the surface. Yeah, I think our group also discussed the third question and leading up to the second question, um, like how on an individual level, it is good to not exclude people. And if I speak for myself, I was also saying like how I radicalized to the left quite quickly in a, in a sh short span of time. And that you have to give people the chance to also um, get to know and be convinced of your views. And this might include um, right-wing people. But I think in our group, we agreed that a, like a formal alliance, if you say, for example, between bigger parties or bigger organizations, we really drew a hard line between not wanting to cooperate with right-wing people or people that hold like extreme right-wing views. Um, also leading to the conclusion that the idea that XR has, and I'm also active with Extinction Rebellion, of mass mobilization and growing as many people as you can, um, that this goal might not be as relevant. Um, if you look, for example, to the second question that you can, with sabotaging, have with fewer people a really large impact. Um, and I think also that, yeah, that, I don't know where I want to go with the story, but yeah, that, that also leading up to the second question that actually this is not the capacity to sabotage things if people are not hurt. And we, I took as an example, Anne Galenda, I don't know if people Notice, but it's a, a mass mobilization action in Germany where people shut down a coal mine. Um, and this is still mass mobilization, like four or 5,000 people. Uh, but it's nowhere near the 3.5% population idea that XR upholds, for example, and they have a really large impact. Yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Maybe jump in here. I mean, I, I, I like that we're all jumping in, and there's lots of vivacious people. Um, so one thing that you're highlighting, uh, Rick, is that it really always, one has to be reminded of what is your intention and then how to adapt your strategy accordingly. Um, different intentions have different strategies that suit them better. Um, one of the things that Indra pointed out is these Sometimes these uh, alliances or overlaps, they don't need to be alliances, but you can suddenly have an ideological or narrative overlap that comes about passively, like without premeditation. Uh, one person is speaking from one vantage point of, yeah, um, autonomy, food sovereignty, self-sufficiency, and another just adds the label of nationalism to it. Uh, and it's the, all the things still hold true. You're just adding another label and you're conflating identity and all other kinds of emotions to that, like national pride of self-sufficiency versus um, planetary pride. Uh, and so this is where things are getting a bit weird. And this was also in my breakout, uh, friends from Holland mentioned how in some of these environmental meetups, you will have people suddenly sharing quite either conservative or right-wing views, or, and again, I would also say right-wing, left-wing isn't necessarily helpful here because when it comes to, I, and I liked uh, how Justin broke it down in terms of valuing what you value, because I'm sure right, uh, right-wing groups would also say that they value human life and their own constituents. So of course, like it, it would be foolish from, from us on the, that might be identifying more with the left um, to pigeonhole the other side. I think that's a ma major fuck up. Um, but 
I would just wanted to share, oh God, this was like the longest preface ever. Uh, but I wanted to share something that was really useful that came out from a podcast I was doing with these, some youth activists from Hong Kong. And we were talking about, um, we, we had a general conversation before the podcast about uh, what's been going on. And they have a very specific set of demands uh, connected to extradition, connected to freedom of speech that they see as mainland China oppressing them with regards to that. And over, you know, they had massive street protests for those who haven't seen. Um, it's, it's been a really big deal of what's been going on and what's been mobilized in the streets of Hong Kong. Lots of activists have been arrested. And suddenly they got a lot of endorsement from right-wing politicians in very smart, and this is like right party, like conservative Republicans from the US. And suddenly Marco Rubio, most symbolically, because uh, he's also with, with, had something to do with foreign affairs, um, I forget his title, but he nominated Joshua Wong, one of the activists, one of the Hong Kong activists for the Nobel Peace Prize. So there are these like little gestures that get a lot of coverage that show this endorsement and for of course um for somebody else that like they might think that marco rubio doesn't give two shits about freedom of speech in hong kong but would just want something that's going to stick in china's craw uh, as a destabilizing factor so it's completely like, the reasons why one would endorse a group could be completely different to what, what you know an activist an xr activist in london might support long hong kong activists for so this is where we really need to dig deeper under the surface and, and look at intentions um because yeah the world's getting more complicated and the activist space is no different okay i, I talked a lot okay does somebody can say something else yeah but following this line like um Russia will support Scotland independence, Catalonia independence for the sake of messing up Europe, right? The fact that they don't, don't necessarily provide any, any kind of minuses to the cause as such, right? There are some actions of right-wing groups, government, etc., that will just be there whether we want them or not, and there is nothing for us to act, if you understand what I'm meaning, yeah? Like that, they can be acknowledged, they can be said, yes, we are actually also supported by Russia, which we never f asked for and Kremlin, thank you Putin, like um, go home. But like, it's still, we are doing this because of this and this and this. I, I think that's, that's um, an, an important addition. And um, talking about respect to other people in very right wing leaning governments that are in power right now in Europe, you have uh, governments who are clearly disrespecting many groups of people. And you stand under a dilemma whether completely disengage from administration, government, or whatever, or provide them pointedly with some kind of advice which they don't have ideas about, right? And it's a very tough choice because, like, ignoring governments for four or eight years means that basically they run on autopilot and can do even worse things. And these are the kind of nitty gritty details you will have to probably ask yourself when, when actually the far right takes power, if they do, on Brazil or other places, right? <laughs> yeah, go for it, Justin. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in then. I just, I guess that this thing about intention is so fundamental. So people at the moment are really criticizing democracy. I'm one of them because I'm wanting to make it better. Other people are criticizing it because they want to undermine people's sense of the kindness of others and the possibility of us working collectively together. So yeah, I just wanted to echo that point that Ivan was making, really distinguishing to when people are criticizing democracy because it needs to be deepened and when they're criticizing it as a way of actually making it shallower. I think there's really, really critical. Intention is everything. Intention is everything. Anybody else? I, hear, I see some nods. I was about to say, I hear some nods. Uh, <laughs> the senses are getting weird on Zoom. Yeah, well, I mean, I was just going to jump in. Something um, that I that I was just thinking about was again, like the the framing. Um, you know, you mentioned the the, or it was mentioned around the alliance around Brexit and and self sufficiency and and you know people pushing for more kind of um, you know local food or, or this or that and how you know oftentimes in a in a bid to find common ground um organizers will 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 try to find things that that people maybe on the other side 
will connect to. And so when we think about, uh, you know, pushing for more local food production, there's been a lot of framing around victory gardens, you know, and like, oh, like victory gardens, like this is, this is something that was pushed, you know, when we were at war and, you know, the right got behind it and, you know, they're going to connect to that. Um, and I've never really thought about how actually dangerous that framing can be um, because of the the historic connection, you know, to what was going on in those moments, and um, you know the milist, the militaristic side, and how that can easily be co opted. So this has just been a good conversation for me. Like I've got gears are are turning, so I really appreciate. It. I just wanted to to add that. Thanks a lot, Tom. Um, I'm I've been in the countryside uh, as well for the last four months, and I'm noticing. Uh, having been in cities for so long, I'm noticing a very different connection to the land and a very different connection to otherness. Um, and so question of outsiders uh, versus local community is so, so, so different. Um, and it's so noticeable within a two, three months of living in the countryside, I'm feeling it. And yet again, the appreciation, so, so there will be racism, there will be homophobia. I have seen examples of both and I'm confronted with them way more. Um, at the same time, appreciation of the land, of the soil, of the water um, is also way higher. It's also, it's way healthier. So these, there's something that I see as a, as a healthy, a really healthy narrative and a very unhealthy narrative are both exaggerated um, in my very small um, example and slice of urban, uh, rural Greece, urban and rural Greece. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm calling from the, the hell hole of the world, Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Coronavirus is on a rise, QAnon, it's just like taking over all the food co-ops. Um, uh, so I'm with an organization called Amplifier and we build media experiments to amplify social movements. Um, and over the last four years, we've been talking about being a bridge between communities. But on reflection, it's very clear that we haven't been doing that. We've been very much speaking within and to progressive communities in major cities. Um, so just in light of that, we were planning on launching a campaign next week that we've been building over the last six months to really go into rural communities, to really be that bridge, to try to connect um, the political parties. And then in light of what happened last week in the US, um, the appetite for uniting is completely gone. Like we were kind of inching towards being able to unite. Um, and now what happened last week, um, people do not want to unite at all. And it's more divided than it's ever been. Um, so I think identifying the communities we want to speak to is really important for the work that we're doing specifically in the US. Um, and we're looking specifically at this group of people that uh, voted for Obama and have been voting Democrat for generations and then switched to voting for Trump. And it's, it's millions and millions of people. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, really looking at what the audience is that you wanna talk to. And I, I think it really is the like rural urban divide that Yvonne was just speaking to. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's interesting times. Um, but I'm really grateful to be connected with you all and to de-center the U.S. in this conversation to complicate things while also knowing that um, it's, it's, it's heavy here, <laughs> for sure. Um, things have changed a lot just over the last week. And uh, I would also, Clea, if you want to drop your website into the chat, I would encourage everybody who wants to look at how visual language, visual poetry, visual analysis uh, factors into political discourse and mobilization of movements, really check out Amplifier's work. They do kick-ass stuff. Um, so yeah, in, in now in extremely adverse conditions. Uh, all right. I I'd like to just uh, offer, I don't know if this is a behavioral economics uh, point of view or a, I'm a psychologist with Get Courage Now. And um, I just put a quote into uh, 
the chat that's basically saying it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. <clears throat> and I think that's something we should keep in mind. And also I wanna mention a really great resource if we have this conversation again, I think who has a lot to teach. Um, and that's a guy named um, John Schmucker who developed an organization called uh, Beyond the Choir, uh, starting in a, in a uh, very polarized community in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Pennsylvania is kind of like Philadelphia on one side, Pittsburgh on the other and Alabama in the middle. It's a very polarized state. And, um, and the only reason it went for Biden was because of, of the strong black liberal population in Philadelphia and the uh, liberal populations in Pittsburgh. Anyhow, um, he's been very effective at getting uh, right and left uh, polarized churches, working in very polarized churches to discover their common ground and work around common uh, causes. And then he later went on to develop uh, Stand Up Pennsylvania which would played a very key role in getting Biden elected. Um, and so he just would be a great resource, I think, um, and for, for this. Uh, Gary, I haven't actually seen the quote. Where is it? Did you put it in or did I miss uh, it? Just now, sorry. Yeah. Great, cool, great quote, I like it. I mean, I'd, I'd um, raise one thing which um, I think is applicable, uh, not just on the European side of the pond, but also on the US side, and um, as, as a possible unifier uh, across political divides, and that is mental health. Um, and I think uh, it's clear that uh, there are a lot of communities that are very uh, stressed at the moment, uh, are, are on all sides of whatever the political divide might be. Um, there's a very interesting um, initiative in the UK, uh, which I'm going to just put a link up about uh, suicide prevention. And it's linked into what is interesting for us at All Hands On, uh, which is democracy innovation. Uh, and so that's the idea of an incredibly uh, um, sensitive and difficult subject, which goes across all boundaries, which is suicide, and which is obviously intimately linked to mental health. And that is a way into what Justin was talking about, which is our common humanity. So um, I hate left-right designations. And I know, like Indra said, they exist, so we can't escape them. But it doesn't mean we have to, in a way, honor them in our every uh, exclamation. Um, so mental health is one of them. And the other one was in our group that came up was this differentiation between alliance, a formal alliance, and keeping a door open. So no to formal alliances with right or extreme right groups, ones that are promoting hate towards any particular um, segment of humanity, um, but an open door and not least with mental health um, elements involved, both sides, uh, to de-radicalization programs. So there's a second link that I'll do, which is a, this great article I read today from Yes Magazine which was a former um, white supremacist who's now uh, working on de-radicalization. And that's part of a, a, a series on the Yes magazine, which is Building Bridges. So it was interesting to hear what Cleo, Cleo had to say about that, um, that you, you're doing that work. There's a whole series of articles that you'll, you can see uh, in that via that link on Yes magazine, which is talking about how to depolarize. Um, so that's it. The last thing I suppose is the local rural is the is the urban rural. I mean, I am I live in a commune in the southwest France rural. Uh, tomorrow, um, I am going on a walk, a local walk uh, with members of the local community who turn up. And whilst there are plenty of hippies here, there are also quite a significant number of um, extreme right voters as well. So it's like, okay, where do you meet them? You meet them walking, and you know, where you walk and you share food, and and then you know. You're not collaborating on a political project, but you're actually putting human faces to political views, which I think is tiny, but it's also valuable. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I would, I would say I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go for a wrap up. I'm also really peeved to do this, considering how interactive you have all been. Um, Thank you so much. I would. Uh, Ivan, can I just mention something really quick? Of course. Go for 30 it. 30 seconds. 
I think this whole conversation would be very remiss if we didn't really point to the Frankensteins that have created this polarization, which is the three major social media companies, Facebook, Google, and Twitter. And I just put into the chat a really brilliant um, three minute piece from Tristan Harris. I hope you all have seen Social Dilemma, the documentary, um, but I think he really nails it about um, what we're really up against. Um, because so much of this polarization, these two very different uh, views of reality uh, in most countries now have been created by this business model of Facebook and Google and, and Twitter. And I think ev every social justice and climate justice, economic justice group needs to also take on uh, these Frankensteins. And Gary, you're making a really important point that is a whole um, other session, which is the lens, the distortive lens of the virtual space that we currently occupy uh, and the real world, the physical world of the senses that we interact with, that distortion in and how it's being weaponized politically is it's 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 a session that we might organize in the coming months, actually. Um, so I would like to give Hillary and Kuba a chance to have any last reflections, and then I'm gonna outro us out so that people can go off and enjoy their weekends. Um, so uh, Hillary, would you like to give us a couple of reflections, closing reflections? Yeah, thank you. Thanks to everyone for a really engaged conversation. I feel like that's not enough in these days. So thank you for the work that you're doing and bringing that here. I think the last thing I would just undermine or just or underline and say is what I care about is um, having these conversations before they're forced upon us, right? So hopefully having collective conversations, getting clear within ourselves, getting clear publicly, doing that well um, and doing that in a way where other people then know what we mean by our politics and our work. So I feel like this space is just one part in that bigger process of getting clear and doing that well with each other. So thank you and cool. Thank you very much. Cool. I'm actually humble and very thankful for the conversation. There have been so many great input, but it's very hard to, to add anything. Um, I'm, just seeing and wishing for a lot more honesty within the NGOs as much, going out of the bubbles. When we talk about grassroots tends to be pretty straightforward, but like those um, uncomfortable conversations within some established NGOs are not really happening that much. And that would also be a good point to from time to time go in and ask those questions in the coalitions, just to know where everybody stands, I think. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close here. I would like to let you know that we will be sharing all kinds of things. So from a bit of an edited version of this session, I've also really liked this Q and A. So I will tinker with it and I see what I can make out of it. I will not use uh, any of your faces without your permission. So I will get in touch with you all um, in case I want to use some of your inputs during the Q and A. And it's not even q and it's a discussion. Um, so that's one thing. I will also share with you a written piece that will emerge from this, as well as information on our forthcoming sessions. If you have any ideas on topics you would like us to bring forward, if you want to participate as a speaker, if you have a speaker that you suggest, and if you have a topic that you would like to suggest, if you would like a point to 2.0 of this session to go deeper into something, um, anything that you want to do, uh, sky's the limit, uh, drop me a line. Um, my email is, most of you probably have it because I have emailed you, uh, but I'm putting it here in the chat once again. And uh, let us know, uh, let me know and we will try to make things happen. I wanna thank uh, Hillary, I wanna thank Kuba for kicking us off in 2021 with a deeper inquiry series. And thank you all for your presence, your mind, your hearts and all that jazz. Um, and now you can enjoy Saturday and Sunday. Uh, hopefully it was a break from the wage slavery that we're, most of us are engaging in uh, until a four day work week at least allows us a little more freedom and joy. <laughs>